Okay, it's 11 o'clock. So, Tenakoto uh, Katoa, no mai haramai, ko Robin Wilkinson toku ingwa. Ke ko na moana fakoka aho e mihiana, he kai tohu tohu aho. So, hello everyone and welcome. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Robin Wilkinson and I'm the Communications Manager at the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. So I'll be your facilitator today. Um, just like to invite you to jump into the chat function and introduce yourself where you are and what you do, um, if you'd like to, so that we can get a sense of who it is that's here today. And of course it um, gives uh, people who are suddenly realizing what the time is just a little minute or two to, to, to join us here. Um, I see some people have discovered the chat function already. <laughs> if you're wondering how to get in, um, you can access it through the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Hello, Eugene. So Eugene's from MPI. I've got uh, Zoe from Auckland Uni. John Kelly from AUT. So uh, central government policy in universities so far. Dave Lundquist from DOC. Hello, Dave. How are you doing? It's been a while. Oh, they're coming through thick and fast now. I might not be able to keep up. So uh, Grant from Waiheke by Sea and the Waiheke Marine Project. Carolyn from uh, NZTRI, AUT. Two Eugenes. Student from Vic, Hannah from Insight. A few uh, AUT people supporting uh, their presenters today. Oh, someone from the UK. Hello, Daryl. Must be quite late for you. Takayuki from the International Tra Travel College. Someone from the PCE. Sorry, they're going too fast for me to see. I'm from Kelly Tartans, another PCE, um, Rika, Eliana. So yeah, a real nice spread um, of people and organizations there. Um, thank you to those who, who shared um, where they're from. Some from Monarch Wildlife Cruises, Neil, Kiara. So that's good, some operators, that's what we like to see as well. So yes, this, this was definitely um, aimed at both um, people who are policy makers and, and involved in regional development and of course the operators themselves. So it's really, really good to see that, that we've got a good mix going on today. Um, and as we just wait, um, give any latecomers another minute or two, I'll just go over some housekeeping. Um, so today's session is being recorded. You should have heard the alert as you came in. Um, we'll send out the link to this recording and the links to the resources that are going to be discussed today um, by the end of Monday, hopefully sooner, but by the end of Monday. Um, today's speakers are Simon Milne, Kerry Ann Wikitera, and Edith Walburn, all from AUT, and they are all part of the Sustainable Seas Growing Marine Ecotourism Project team. So they're going to present for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, if you would like to submit a question, um, please use the Q&A function, which is in the reactions section. So again, that's in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can do this at any time during the presentation, but we'll, we'll hold the questions to the end um, when I'll read them out and then to the presenters so that everybody can hear them. Um, if your name and organization isn't clear from the name that's on your account, which is the name that's shown in the bottom um, of your individual video screen, it'd be really great if you could include that name and organization or sector in, in your question, or you can also rename yourself by right clicking on, on the name that's shown there. Um, it just helps sometimes to give a bit of context to whether um, about the question that can help the presenters answer um, with the information that you're looking for. Um, so now it, it, I'll hand over to Kerri Ann, who's going to open the session with a karakia. So thank you, Kerri Ann. Mau ki te tapunui a tāme, tēnei te kaha mau, mau ki tēnei rā, tēnei te kaha mau, tūturu, whakamaua, kia tīna, tīna, haumi e, hui e, taieki e. 
Thank you, Robin, and the Sustainable Seas Challenge whānau, kia ora koutou katoa. This proverb, ki ngā here pūrengi, rangi tā miro ai kō whao o te ngira, kia takaka wehia te arapautama. This proverb was gifted to us by Tai Tūwha King and Valence Smith, my dear colleagues and whānau from AUT University, tēnā kōrua. In the context of this webinar research, it philosophically speaks to the beginning, uh, bringing together of learnings from the sector, the first stage of our research from the operators, the aspirations, challenges and opportunities, and the next stage we're seeking to bring together um, the guidance of those of and on the marine environment, the taiao. No mai, haere mai ki tēnei zui, ki a mātou ko Simon, ko Ailey Hoki, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tarawera te maunga, tarawera te moana, te aroa te iwi, te haurangi ngā te wahi ao te hapu, te pākira te marae, wahi ao te pare, kei tāmaki makaurau i tānau mai i te puake, uh, Dr. Kiri Wiki te rāhau, tēnā koutou katoa. In this introduction, my pipiha, I declare my subjectivities, my worldview, my obligation to the moana, my place in this research. I hail from the Lakes District of Aotearoa, New Zealand, Lake Tarawera, Rotokākahi, Tikitapu, the Blue and Green Lakes. They are far from the ocean, uh, to Moana Nui Akewet, or the Pacific. However, I was born and raised and still live in Tamaki Makaurau the rohe of Ngāti Whātua ki o Rākei, Ngāti Pāua, Ngāti ki Tāmaki e Ngāti Wai. My tamariki and mokopuna live on the papakainga here in Orake. I therefore have an obligation to optimise, protect and sustain the moana for future generations and thus my desire to be part of the sustainable seas research. Kia koutou ngā moana, Tēnā koutou, kia koutou, kia kua hui hui mai nei, tēnā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā da koutou katoa. Welcome to our presentation today. I will now hand the presentation over to my research colleagues, Ailey and Simon. Ngā mahi. Kia ora kere. Um, ko kia ora tātou, ko Ilza Craigs in Scotland, te manga. Ko Firth of Clyde, Te Awa, no Tamaki Ahau, ko Thorburn Toko Whanau, ko Ely Toko Ingoa. And my name's Ely, I'm a researcher on this project. I'm originally from Scotland and I grew up near the sea there, so that's my, um, my mountains in the sea um, there and um, my, my sea's over there, but I also live in Tamaki Makaurau and i um, lucky enough to be able to paddle my feet in the, in the sea here every day as well. So. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Simon to start our webinar. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Simon Milne, toko ingoa. It's a, a real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce you to our work today. Uh, I should also say that in addition to the three speakers, we, we are also lucky enough to work with a great team of uh, researchers at Lincoln University, uh, led by Chris Rosen. Um, they are involved with other sections of this work, um, and uh, we'll, we'll be uh, focusing on this work today as a, as a group of, uh, of three uh, presenters. I'm going to be uh, talking today about a wide range of work, and it's always difficult to squeeze things into 25 or 30 minutes, but I've tried to summarise the key themes that we'll be looking at today here. Uh, what does marine and coastal ecotourism mean in the uh, New Zealand context? Um, what, does, uh, what does ecotourism mean for operators? What does success look like uh, in the sector? Um, what's the size and scale of operations, operations in the sector? What are some of the key characteristics that we see emerging? And also, what are the challenges and opportunities that face operators now and also uh, into the future? And we'll end up by looking a little bit at uh, what, what may, may be done to help the development of the sector and maybe some of the resources that we can be generating through this work and through other uh, work uh, to assist the sector moving forward. 
just to outline what I'll be talking about, we're, we're looking at two baseline reports, one of which I think has already been sent to uh, people participating today and is available on the Science Challenge uh, website. That's baseline report one. Uh, that report is based on uh, and around a database which was put together uh, earlier this year um, looking at online resources to identify uh, those operators that we thought could fit within a marine and coastal ecotourism uh, sort of uh, definition. I'll talk some more about that in a minute. We've also over this uh, year uh, been working to complete baseline report two. Now that is not yet uh, online, but it's currently going through its review process with the Science Challenge, and we'll be sharing some of the information from that as well. That gives us a broader context for the sector. Uh, we're, we're drawing on interviews, uh, in-depth interviews with 28 operators, and also a, a national survey, which was drawn from and, and sent to those uh, operators in the database. So baseline two is a uh, is a report that is yet to come, but we will be certainly drawing on that uh, quite a bit, and you'll be able to get onto that to look at it at the Science Challenge site in the coming weeks. Uh, just to quickly uh, mention um, what kind of coverage we got with this work, um, you can see here it's a rather complex figure, but we've got the interviews, the survey responses, and also the database numbers. You can see that we've covered a wide range of different activities. Um, we've also tried to get a very good uh, regional coverage, if we could, across the country. Um, I've just highlighted there also that we have um, got Māori-owned uh, operations in the mix here, among those that we interviewed and also surveyed. Um, I'll be coming back to these various um, uh, data sets as we go through the presentation. I just want to start off by talking about um, how do we define marine and coastal ecotourism. It's a, it's a fairly fraught area. There's lots of different definitions out there. Um, we, we believe that our work, part of our work is to really try and develop a, a definition that is suited to uh, the context in New Zealand. And it may well be that that definition is a fairly broad and wide ranging one. It may be something that is very flexible. As we started off uh, the work, we obviously, in developing the database, had to have some framework to work with them. And so we decided to use this one, which was to include businesses that, in terms of their online uh, presence, their websites, etc., were shown to be uh, low impact, uh, non extractive marine and coastal uh, tourism activities. And you can see in the green uh, box here the kinds of activities and operations that were included. And you can see in the red, uh, what we did exclude. Now we're well aware of course that ecotourism and marine ecotourism does not operate within a vacuum and it's, it's pointless to pretend that it's not part of a broader marine tourism um, sector in New Zealand. But for us our focus is very clearly on, at the moment on these uh, low impact activities as we're developing that database. We're aware, of course, though, that there may be businesses and operations that uh, could well fit within that database definition as time goes on. Uh, the, the approach that we have taken here is to think about different types of operations as being situated on the, I guess, around the intersection of two continua. Uh, one of those along the x-axis looks at the direct interaction with the marine environment that's uh, received by the, uh, the client. Uh, the other one looks at the degree to which the, operation, the operations are embracing uh, what we might call active uh, marine ecotourism values, uh, or perhaps, uh, perhaps are, are not or are only partially doing that. So what we're really trying to get at here is that we believe over time this database and this definition will no doubt uh, grow, develop further, become more nuanced. It's a work in progress, and it's one that we're very keen to continue on as we uh, go through our, our project. One of the things that certainly emerged uh, very early on from our work was the fact that um, when we asked operators uh, in the interviews, what does marine ecotourism mean to you? There were some core values that emerged and these values were, were very much underpinning people's uh, ideas of success in the sector as well. Obviously, um, it's important to have a, a business operation that's well managed and is profitable. That provides you the platform upon which you can grow and develop uh, your business. 
but there were clear messages that emerged five these are the five major messages that emerged from the work um, and I just want to go through those in a little bit more detail because in a sense they provide the, the sort of core values upon which the sector seems to feel it's uh, it's um, under is underpinning it the most uh, significant of these and the, the one that came through the strongest from those interviews was actively caring for the environment. That is seen as a core value uh, for those that operate uh, in this sector. Uh, there's a sense of duty and responsibility uh, to pass on a healthy environment to the next uh, generation. There's a desire to actually work with and assist um, uh, the, the thriving of, of wildlife and, and ecosystems. Uh, helping to enable and, con and conduct scientific research, for example. Also, a real focus on sharing knowledge uh, and enabling people to experience that m marine world. They these are all key core elements of uh, ecotourism, marine ecotourism operations. And just as an example of that, you can see that we've got uh, around three quarters of the respondents to this question are saying that they are actually uh, part of the uh, New Zealand's Qualmark Sustainable Tourism Scheme. There are also a large percentage uh, in the Tourism Sustainability Commitment from the TIA. And also we've got about a third of respondents that are part of the Voluntary Department of Conservation Smart Operator Scheme. So these are operators that are looking to uh, engage with and, and enhance um, their operations and their impacts on that uh, surrounding environment. It's also fair to say that when we look at some of these tourism programs, such as Qualmark, uh, there are comments made about their ability to really capture um, some of what marine ecotourism is about. And we certainly had examples here, and you can see a couple of quotes uh, from Maori operators uh, who were talking about the need for these standards to go beyond uh, what we see here is uh, called the norm. Are looking for ways to perhaps go beyond uh, simple sustainability to embrace ideas of regenerative uh, tourism, uh, looking for ways that we can bring new standards, new ideas into the mix uh, as we go forward. Also very important to give back to people in place. Um, this is a critical uh, feedback that we got from our interviews and also came through very strongly in the survey work that we did. Uh, building links to community, helping to uh, helping regions to become uh, stronger in terms of their economic diversity and their tourism uh, performance. Uh, working also closely in terms of relationships with, with Māori and also being uh, very clear that when you're working as a, as a business in the sector, you're, you're working as a team. You're trying to support and build your people, uh, your staff and hoping to uh, obviously enhance their opportunities as time goes on. Here we can just see another example of this. 85% um, of respondents to the survey, for example, saying that they interact with uh, local schools. Um, well over half saying that they are actually interacting to in an, in an active way with conservation groups. So again, this is a sector that's looking to, uh, to give back. It's also about delivering an inspiring and enjoyable experience to visitors, uh, making sure that you are passing on a passion, uh, passing on knowledge, and also being innovative in the way in which you do that, trying to build experience through things like the use of, of new technologies. Also critical, another critical value is the idea of trying to run a low impact operation whether that's through uh, local sustainability practices, uh, carbon offsetting, improving the design or performance of the experiences that you uh, put out there for visitors, or actually very practical things like improving boat design and performance. All of these are ways that uh, marine and coastal ecotourism operators can uh, lower uh, their impact. And finally, but and certainly not least, we come to the, the broader uh, focus on te taio. Um, this is seen as absolutely critical uh, by both Māori and non-Māori businesses. Uh, there's a lot of focus on, on tikanga, uh, being informed by Matauranga Māori, uh, privileging mana moana, and also looking to give back uh, to iwi, hapu, um, wherever possible. 
So there was a real sense here that this was a, an area that we needed to look at uh, and, and, and as a focus as we move forward. And just again, drawing from the broader survey work, it's interesting to see that uh, around three quarters of respondents um, say that they would welcome the opportunity to collaborate with iwi or other iwi in developing marine and coastal experiences. A third say that uh, operators say that they are already currently working with iwi. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area where I think we've got great opportunity to develop and grow. But of course, that also brings some challenges and some need for learnings and understanding. Uh, here are just a couple of quotes that have come through uh, from Mana Moana, talking about sharing tikanga, uh, relating that to operating in the marine environment, but also thinking very carefully about how that whole process is handled and managed, looking at issues, for example, uh, like uh, cultural knowledge, uh, intellectual property, et cetera. Another message that comes through clearly is that we have to be careful when it comes to the term ecotourism. Uh, there was often concern about this being used perhaps purely as a marketing tool and in particular as a, as a greenwashing tool. So as this quote here indicates, this is an area that we need to be very careful with in terms of the use of uh, this terminology. It needs to be scrutinized carefully. We need to think about measures and, and other frameworks that can perhaps help us understand uh, the sector and its performance and be used to perhaps help with these definitions as we move forward. I'm just going to shift a little bit now to give you a little bit more of a, a quick background uh, on the sector. This is material drawn from the survey, um, it just gives you a quick snapshot of how, how the sector looks. Obviously we do have a sector that's uh, highly seasonal uh, with a lot of um, business occurring during that, those summer periods and into the shoulder seasons before the winter. Um, we can see around uh, three quarters of them are saying that they do operate all year round, but obviously a very seasonal uh, sector. There's a quite a wide range of turnover uh, by business, um, but you can see here that around 36% of operators surveyed have an annual turnover of $100,000 or less in that June 2020 to May 2021 period. Now, obviously, this is also a period that's defined by COVID and uh, lockdowns and, uh, and uh, openings, etc. So there have been, it's been a challenging time. Uh, but we can see clearly that in terms of turn turnover, there are a lot of smaller businesses in the sector. And that's also reflected when we look at employment. Um, this is just a slide showing high season employment, uh, full time and part time. Um, you can see that uh, median uh, figures for full time and part time employment during the high season are about three. Um, so this is a small and medium enterprise dominated sector, but there are some large players as well. In terms of COVID, there's no doubt that the impact has been significant as, as it has been for the entire uh, tourism sector. Um, this just gives you some idea uh, of the kind of uh, changes that we have seen. Um, you can see that the bulk of operators say that they have seen a reduction in customer numbers uh, over this uh, period, June to May 2021, um, June 2020 to May 2021, compared to January, December 2019. But we also have some, you know, some high points with some operators actually seeing an increase, and most of those have been in the upper uh, North Island. Certainly there are some regions that have, uh, at least in terms of our respondents, have actually seen no uh, stability or increase, just pure uh, decrease in visitor numbers. So there's an important regional dimension here that needs to be explored, and that's something that Haley will be coming back to a little bit later. Out of our surveys and our interviews, there were a number of challenges and opportunities that were um, highlighted and that emerged. And I just want to summarize those quickly. Again, there's far more detail in baseline report two, which will be available for you to look at very soon. I think obviously COVID uncertainty was a big factor and that continues to be a big factor as we move forward. But even before COVID, this was a sector that was struggling sometimes to find and retain skilled and qualified staff. That issue has, has only been intensified by COVID, especially as we've seen 
difficulty accessing uh, temporary or short-term uh, 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 people coming to New Zealand and then working for short periods of time in the sector. There's also the high cost of compliance uh, with regulations, etc. the time and money uh, that's involved. Concerns around broader environmental degradation. Um, if the marine environment is degraded, then the very essence of this sector uh, is diminished. And I guess uh, this comes through very strongly. Also, we see concerns around climate change, uh, more extreme weather events causing challenges. Uh, a sense that there's, uh, especially during COVID, a, a real increase in marine resource users that puts uh, obviously pressure on that particular resource and on the sector. And another thing that came through clearly was concerns over negative community perceptions of tourism. Prior to COVID, in some cases, this was around the notion of over tourism, too many visitors in some places. Uh, with COVID, this has become more of an issue of will, will community welcome visitors back, if, especially if COVID is seen as a vector for the transmission of uh, the virus. That being said, there are a number of opportunities that also present themselves. And obviously the broader reset of tourism is something that's very relevant here as well. As we saw before, this is a chance to focus on things like giving back and sustainable business practices that are already very much key values in this uh, sector. It's also about looking for ways to collaborate and work more closely with other operators and to also strengthen uh, community links. Looking for ways to build on the domestic market, which has obviously been something of a savior for some operators over the last uh, year or two. This has brought the domestic traveler back into into focus and also of course has highlighted the important role that education and school groups can play for the sector as well. I think also there's a very clear message that we need to look at adding dimensions to existing experiences, uh, listening to the moana, make sure that we're informed by the voices of mana moana and also um, linking more effectively where possible into marine and coastal decision making. And just on that front, again, the data shows us that this is a group that um, wants to be involved with decision making. At the moment, around half of those surveyed say that they are already involved in planning initiatives for tourism and or coastal and marine issues. 87% um, say they would like to be more involved and they feel that they have something to give back and they do have something to give back. They're experienced operators in this environment and they have uh, a lot of inf information I believe that they would like to share and, um, and uh, be, they'd just like to be more part of that process. Another key message that comes through is around collaboration. And we can see that actually the majority of survey respondents, um, uh, nearly 80% say that they do seek out business advice, mainly from other operators. Unfortunately, though, what we found also from the survey that just over one third of operators say that they actually share information with others. So that leads us to believe that there are some um, challenges in uh, people gathering the information, getting the mentoring, uh, understanding some of the challenges that they face. And uh, we can see here that other marine operators are seen as perhaps the best place to go to for that kind of advice. So one of the questions we have is how can we improve collaboration and working between operators, how can we build opportunities for uh, the sharing of best practice and understanding. We also asked people about what they thought could be used to support the sector and uh, here of course um, there was a big focus again on collaboration, um, networking, improving information sharing with key organizations for example like uh, DOC. Um, Funding and support for marine ecotourism from within uh, regional tourism budgets and from within uh, kind of resources, which uh, some people felt were often pushed towards maybe larger operators. Uh, a key message coming through was the need to strengthen marine protection, uh, legislation, standards and enforcement. Without that protection, this is a sector that is going to struggle uh, to deliver on, on what it wants to achieve. Um, also, uh, ideas around assisting linkages with education and learning experiences outside the classroom, helping to um, bolster understanding of that and, and support the sector in those areas. Uh, people looking for improved sustainable tourism accreditation, um, 
looking to uh, increase accountability to some extent and to broaden and the understanding of the sector and those accreditation programs, but also perhaps thinking about reducing costs of being part of those programs, given the small scale of operators. And of course, also the idea that it would be very good to have resources and information available, and in particular, available in a place that's accessible. And when we looked in a little bit more detail about what people would like to see in the way of resources, um, we can see a number of things uh, coming through here. Clearly a desire to learn from others in the form of best practice examples and cases, uh, getting improved access to research and insights that can be used as part of the, the experiences that are provided and to understand operators' performance. Uh, linking more closely to um, schools and school programs and also gaining and learning about how to embed uh, cultural mataranga Māori dimensions into business. That was another thing that came through very strongly. Also a place where operators can share knowledge, ideas and experiences. So what this shows is that there are resources, there are tools that the sector um, believes can assist. And we were heartened by the interview and survey responses that also highlighted the fact that people were really very pleased to be asked these questions and to have a chance uh, to provide feedback. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, pass on to my colleague Ailey Thilburn um, from the New Zealand Tourism Research Institute at AET and she's going to talk a little bit more about the um, development of resources for this uh, project. Ailey, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, I'd just like to go over two resources that we've built um, from the uh, database, um, which we built from a web audit of marine and coastal ecotourism operators. The two resources are an interactive Google map and a data dashboard. Um, these tools are designed to be living resources. We've um, sort of established a baseline of around 300 operators. Um, and really hoping to get some feedback. And we've already had some great feedback coming through. For example, on this map, we're looking at if we can customize some of the icons. Um, this is just an example of the Google map, a, a screenshot. Um, on the Sustainable Seas website, you can have a look um, and toggle on the categories. Uh, yep, let's move to the categories. So from the database, we identified 10 bigger categories. We defined the categories by the primary focus. So when there was an overlap on what operators did, for example, if you're a coastal tour that looks at penguins, um, where the focus was clearly on penguins, they were categorized as wildlife. And for some operators, there was a multitude of different activities. Um, and so where it was hard to define a main focus, we have categorized them as various. Uh, this is just an example of some of these categories on the Google map. So on the left-hand side, I've toggled on dive and snorkel and had a look at uh, the national picture in New Zealand. You can see there that most dive and snorkel operators are in the North Island a significant cluster in the upper north and also quite a significant cluster uh, down in Wellington there. Uh, just another example from the interactive tool that you can have a play around with. On the right hand side there I've looked at kayak and sup compared to dive and snorkel and I've zoomed in on the south island there and um, so you can see that there's uh, significantly more kayak and sup operators in the south island than there is dive operators. And you can start to see those clusters um, of where those activities are really important in the marine and tourism ecosystem. Um, and up in Nelson, yeah, Nelson, Tals, Tasman and Marlborough up, up there. Um, for the wildlife category, we did divide it into um, six different things. And that's just really to show the diversity of the wildlife sector and show the difference between um, the marine mammals and the, the seabirds. So the dashboard allows you just another tool to visualize things. In the, in the Google Maps, we did map all locations of operators. So for example, if you operate out of Wellington and Auckland, you'll be shown on the Google Map. 
with the dashboard, we've looked just at the head offices, just trying to get the, the sort of total number of operators. So what I've done with the dashboard here in this example is compared Auckland and Canterbury. On the left hand side is a heat map which shows the density of operations. So you can see that in total, Auckland has a significant amount of marine and coastal ecotourism operators. And in Canterbury there, you can see two sort of hotspots, which is reflecting Akaroa and Kaikoura. On the right hand side, whoops, <laughs> on the right hand side, you can see the different activities compared from Auckland to Canterbury. So in Canterbury, there's a really strong focus on the wildlife um, subsector. And in Auckland, we've got a really good diversity of all of the different types of marine and coastal ecotourism activities. Um, and this is really sort of set, sets the scene for our um, case study research. So I'll hand over to Kerry. Tiro, tiro, kita, kita, keia, ra, keia, kei ronga ki, kei raro ki, kei roto i taku moe, moe, ya. My late uncle, Putu Mihaka composed this lullaby for his mokopuna. Translated, looking down at his mokopuna, the Kuroa asks, where are you? What are you thinking? Where are you going? What places are you? Where are these places? Are they above or are they below? No matter where you go, you will always be in my thoughts and my dreams. This waiata speaks to the spiritual realm, whakapapa, multi-generational knowledge, the aspirations of our ancestors, and to think about our world and our actions as, as we walk upon the dreams of our ancestors. Messages that inspire caution, protection, sustainability, sharing, reciprocity and care, all key aspects that came from the surveys and interviews of the marine ecotourism operators in stage one. The next steps in this research are designing and developing and actioning the case study research. This is where we carefully consider uh, the data presented today and we move more into listening to the voice of the moana. Jo Harawera, a komato of the Kahui Māori group overseeing the Sustainable Seas uh, National Science Challenge, explains the overarching kaupapa for our work, Te Au o Te Moana, the voice of the ocean. He says Te Au o Te Moana means the voice, the sounds, the cry of the ocean. It denotes a voice or information insight into what is going on above, within and beneath the waves. A sense of the state of the ocean and our responsibility in relationship to the Modi, wairua, mana and tapu within. So stage two of this research is listening to that voice. To consider the multi-stakeholder nature of the marine ecotourism sector, we have started by bringing together an expert Māori rōpū, all who whakapapa to the case study region here in Tamaki Makoto. We privilege their voices, voices that hold thousands of years of knowledge of te moana nui Akewa, local voices that can lead us in the case study design and development. So if we go have a look at the slide here, the two locations, oh, go back. Um, the two locations selected for the case study uh, work, we are yet to confirm the actual region that we're going to work with um, for Tamaki Makoto. And then we have the South Island um, Lincoln University research team who have selected Akaroa uh, for the case study design. Um, I'll leave it at that and we can, um, respond to questions. Um, just, just wanted to say that the rationale really for selecting the case studies, um, particularly in Auckland, is because there is uh, so much activity happening in the sector in Auckland um, and, and big challenges to um, bringing stakeholders together. So, no data, ka koutou katoa, tēnā koutou.
question and answers now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kerry Ann and um, Ailey and Simon. So some people have um, been very keen and um, um, jumped straight into the questions. Um, Simon, if you want to, do you want to stop sharing your screen so that um, you, Ailey and uh, Kerry Ann are all big, big for everybody. Um, so just so I don't, I'll cover up my own face. I'm just repositioning where we go. Um, so we've got a question from Jeff Tingley who says, why choose to ask questions about income and staffing during the main COVID period rather than an earlier period that would more likely be representative of the sector because the COVID period data are likely to provide a poor baseline for future comparisons? Well, that's a great question. And of course, it's one that we as researchers definitely uh, grappled with. Um, I've only been able to give you a bit of a snapshot of, of what we have here. And you would have seen, I think, even in one of those slides that we did ask people to compare uh, their current situation with where they were situated prior to COVID. Um, I, I certainly take your, your point. Uh, you could almost say that 2019 was an example of what we might call peak tourism. In fact, you might even call it over-tourism. Uh, I'm not sure that 2019 will represent a closer uh, example of where we're going to go to in the future than perhaps uh, where we are now or where we're starting to move to in 2022. But it'll be interesting to see. So yes, we're, we're obviously aware that, um, that this is a sector like much of tourism that's had uh, big, big changes in the last uh, year. But we did want to talk about what was happening now. And we, we did certainly draw comparisons back to 2019 and uh, prior to COVID. Okay. Um, thanks, Simon. We've got another one from Carolyn Dutcher. Having gone through the work to date, what do you think is the key opportunity for marine and coastal ecotourism going forward? So can the sector be an example of tourism operating as a more sustainable or regenerative sector? Can it lead to the reset? Would someone else on the team like to go first? I don't want to hog uh, hog things there. Ailey or Kerry, or would you like me to start off? No, Kerry? Uh, Ailey? Yeah. You go for it, Simon. <laughs> You're all being very modest. Not, not exactly a stampede to answer. That one. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a great question. I suppose... Um, I think, I think the opportunities are fantastic for the sector to lead the way, if you like, for New Zealand tourism. There is a lot of talk about regeneration. Uh, I don't think we always understand what that term means, but certainly from my perspective, even if we go back to what I believe are the core principles of sustainable development, the sustainable development goals, uh, this is a sector that really can lead the way and in many ways does lead the way already, as you can see from some of the work that we've been presenting. I think going forward, um, clearly there are opportunities here to see a sector that will be playing a major role in helping to regenerate, um, raise awareness of the marine environment. Uh, but from my own personal perspective, I also think we see a, a really good example here of businesses and a sector that can connect very directly to community and community benefit. Um, and that's an area I think that we'll be wanting to um, look at further as we go through our case study work and certainly will be a, a major focus going forward. We want, I think one of the things from this reset of tourism is a focus on a more community centric approach to tourism. And I think this is a sector that can certainly uh, do well in that respect. Others on the team. Ailey or Kerry, got, would you like to add or are you happy to move on? Do you have something to add, Kerry? Nah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one from Grant Crawford. How do additional operators be added to the database and map? Um, from Grant from Waiheke by Sea, I think, uh, contacting the, the research team, I said, yeah? Is yeah, that the... definitely. I'll um, put our email, maybe I'll get Robin to send our email address out. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's awesome to um, get feedback from the operators. Um, already, you'll see the dashboard has been updated. Um, we've just, as people have fed back to us, we've, we've just updated it. Something that I should have said during the presentation is, well, how do we sustain this database going forward over time? And that's something that 
as a research team that we're we're thinking about and how can you know that web web data might might be a little bit out of date from what's on the website you know how could we maybe get user feedback or could we create a tool that is user generated so that operators can go in there and update their information and things like that so that's an ongoing um focus for us as a team Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, oh, sorry, I was going to say, Ailey, I think that's yeah. a really good point. Um, this is a, a living uh, thing. And we see it, as I mentioned, also as a resource that may well expand as operators and, and uh, different stakeholders perhaps move more and more into this space. Uh, so, yeah, for us, um, any kind of feedback, any kind of input is very welcomed. Uh, Ailey and the team did a fantastic job in putting that initial database together. Uh, obviously, now we want to expand and build on that. And I do believe that a user-generated approach will be the best way to sustain things over time and also could be a great way to get operators to think again about how they can work together and learn from each other. Okay, great. Yes, um, Ailey, if you give me a, a, a contact email address, I will include that in the um, follow-up email when I send the recording link and everything. Um, so from Jeff Tingley, uh, for the dashboard, you showed comparison in numbers by area. Have you considered additional comparisons such as by number of staff or value? Yes. So on the data, uh, on the dashboard itself, we do have a um, number of staff comparison. Just a slight limitation, obviously, um, with the method of a of a web audit, it's only available information on the website, so it's a bit you know it's a bit of a head count. Um, there is um, some data missing there, which is shown on the dashboard, and it really just sort of reinforces this notion of um, operators being able to go in there and, and update the information um, on on the dashboard. Okay, thanks. Um, and one from Christine Fox at Te Farawaka o Pōneke. Uh, in relation to the case study Ropu with Te Ao Māori Lens, why exclude other Māori-owned businesses who may benefit from the discussion? Should be an invitation to sit in at least to understand the other challenges presented in um, Takiwa Rohi who need to strengthen Māori voice, um, especially in policy development. Oh, kia ora. I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, thank you, Christine, for your question. Uh, Essentially, when we um, were looking at the vision of Mana Moana, um, particularly in the case study of Tamaki Makoto, uh, we decided that we were going to um, be led by Mana Moana. And when, we, um, when I sat down and looked at the amount of um, hapu and the tam Tamaki Makoto, uh, it was really complex. And so we... Um, uh, communicated with Mana Moana as best we could, and it wasn't the ecotourism businesses that we um, identified to communicate with. We uh, looked at different experts that were actually uh, working in the Moana, such as, um, you know, uh, rejuvenation of water quality in Okahu Bay with the mussel beds. Um, we've got um, people from... Um, uh, Great Barrier Island and um, uh, who are working on the, um, the Rahui, the um, uh, uh, fishing rights, pollution and, and so forth. So we didn't actually identify our experts from the ecotourism businesses um, in Tāmaki, although we have now got um, Mana Moana uh, representation who are developing their marine ecotourism businesses and, and those that are already um, up and running and, uh, on the Moana. So the upshot of it is, no, we're not just focus, um, focusing on uh, businesses. We're actually looking at the Taiyo and how that we can be informed um, through Mana Moana. Um, and uh, we, we also identified that we can't just do a blanket whole nation um, research that it had to be local, that the Matauranga was contextualised to uh, the Mana Moana and how that knowledge can inform um, sustainability and all of these other things around um, the Taiyo of the Moana, with the, with the hope that we can scale it and um, replicate the type of case study um, throughout the country. 
So um, it's been a really exciting and interesting um, process. And um, I'm not sure if any of our expert group are on the webinar and you, you might want to um, comment too. Kia ora. Uh Kia ora, carry on. Thank you. Um, if any of those expert panel advisory group are on, if you raise your hand um, via the um, toolbar at the bottom, I can unmute you. Um, but while well, we just see if that happens, I'll move on to the next one. Um, Aroha Mike, Jeffrey, I think I might have accidentally skipped your question. So um, what is the percentage of eco businesses in the marine sector? Sorry, the percentage of eco business in the marine sector compared with all tourism business included. Um, you say there are just over 300 marine ecotourism operators in New Zealand. How does that compare to the total number of marine tourism, i.e. those who aren't considered as eco? Do you wanna yes. jump in there, Simon, or? Yeah, no, I'm happy to jump in, Ailey. It's just, I saw you were unmuted, so I thought maybe you were coming in. Um, look, that's a great question. And I guess, again, it comes down partly to definitional issues as well. Um, we've got 300 operators in that database at the moment, but that could well and will, in fact, I'm sure, change and expand over time. Um, we're also very aware that marine tourism as a whole is not overly well understood in New Zealand. And uh, in, an, in a, another piece of work we haven't mentioned today is of course a literature review that we did at the very start of this project. And that really highlighted in general, uh, the lack of understanding about the broader sector and its value. And that, that again becomes a definitional thing. Some people have looked at uh, marine tourism as include, including everything that's within a kilometer of the coastline. Uh, others have looked at it in a much more um, specific way. So I'm afraid at this point, I don't have an answer, but I would love to follow up on that uh, question. And that, that is certainly one of the things that we could be looking to build in and develop as we move forward with the project. Uh, I think it, what it really does highlight is that um, there are challenges here in terms of um, having that, that, that broader information and data available. And we, we're hoping to plug some of those gaps. I just follow that by saying, you know, when we first started out on this project and a bit of a rationale be behind why we built the database is that, that you know, that we had no idea how many um, marine tourism businesses there were, how many marine ecotourism businesses there were, you know, that's a bit of a problem in the tourism sector in general, that there isn't any list that says there is X amount of tourism businesses, there is X amount of um of these businesses and that's why we wanted to build a bit of a baseline but it would be interesting to compare to the to the wider um, marine sector yeah okay we have seven minutes and five six more questions so um we'll, we'll see how we go so from claire louis um says thanks for the presentation did the results show what compliance is considered as challenging eg money and time for the operators in the wildlife category such as whale watching I think I can answer that one. It was, um, it was the compliance was really around um, the cost of the adventure activity audits that seemed to be the the biggest um, the biggest cost, and also the operators felt like there was multiple different people that they had to comply with. And two, I think there was one operator told us that there were seven, six or seven different. Um, regulatory agencies who they had to comply with. Obviously, Maritime New, Ze uh, Maritime New Zealand is a big one, um, but it, that wasn't seen as, as the cost, the actual um, financial cost of the adventure activity audits, especially during COVID, um, was seen as, as significantly high, sometimes putting operators out of business or that they had to change the type of business they were operating so that they didn't fall under those, those audits. Okay, um, from Zoe Koo, thanks for the talk. I was just wondering why you didn't include recreational fishing while you were collecting data, because recreational fishing is a big part of our tourists or used to be, maybe the definition of ecotourism here. It's hard to track, yes, isn't it? I, yes, again, it, it, is, uh, it, is, it is a definitional issue there. And um, we've also got to think a little bit of, as I said before, where does recreational fishing fit within the kind of uh, continua that I outlined earlier? Um, can, we, can we really at the moment um, 
fit it into this uh, definition? Uh, perhaps not. If, if we're talking about uh, charter fishing, for example, and people being taken out for um, trips to, to fish, um, that's an area certainly where I think we may see some interesting overlaps with the kind of de definition we have. And we know for sure that there are charter operators, uh, charter fishing operators that are looking to maybe expand or develop other dimensions to their business. So um, it comes back, I think, to also that question that Kerry dealt with earlier. We're also just a little constrained by budget and time, as, as are all researchers. And so in some ways we have to um, ring fence what we do, but we do hope that what we do can be scaled or moved into other sectors and other areas as well. Ailey, I'm not sure if you had anything to add there. Uh, no. No? Okay. No. okay. Um, so from Daryl Casti, what is meant by the reset of tourism in a New Zealand context? <laughs> <laughs> with resets in the in the single quotes <laughs> well i could i could also say reimagination uh, there's, there's been all sorts of uh labels used and actually just coming from a two-day pacific island research symposium the same kinds of terms are used there as well it, it's really about i guess this hiatus that we've had that's been brought about by um the development of uh, covid and by the closure of borders uh, the idea that rather than sitting, sitting down and twiddling our thumbs, this has been a chance to re-look at tourism, re-look at the impacts it has and the, and the benefits it brings and how we can broaden those and make it a more sustainable industry. So the reset is really about that. The question is really, from my perspective, is the reset really going to be something that is sustained and lasts or are we simply gonna be pouring some old wine into some new bottles? Um, I think that's where this sector is so exciting because it is an example, I think, of a, of a part of the blue economy that is going to have the potential to really deliver on some of those promises that are being made under the, the heading of a reset or a, a reimagination of tourism. Okay, thanks. Um, we have three minutes left and three questions. So, um, I mean, they're all great questions. So. It, it, if none of you have to run off, I propose that we just try and get through them. We might go five minutes over because we're, we're holding the number of attendees. So everyone's obviously very engaged. So as long as um, you're all okay to just stay on that extra five minutes, I'll, I'll crack on with the three. Um, so uh, we've got one from Eliana Ferretti. Um, Kia ora and thanks for the great talk. You mentioned Māori operators expressed a desire to go one step further and move towards restorative practices. What do you think the main challenges and op opportunities are in that space in terms of restorative practices operated by the ecotourism sector? I'll jump in there. So um, once we start doing the case study research, we're hoping to uh, look and provide a bit more depth around um, res restorative sustainability and so forth and how we can bring the sector together to address some of the um, concerns around the tie-all. Essentially, with our, um, our case study research, we're privileging uh, the voices of mana moana. And we are um, finding just from the survey, from the interviews and initial discussions and developing the case study that the taiao was the most important thing. So um, uh, everything about environmental sustainability and informed by Mātauranga Māori is, is kind of the way that the case study looks like it's, it's um, evolving into. Um, the, we have experts in that space around restorative, um, I was going to say justice, but restorative practices in the environmental space. Um, and, you know, there is challenges, but uh, we're not going to take a deficit model and look at um, the poor state of our moana. We are looking at the aspirations of the mana moana as a voice for the, for the ocean. So looking at their aspirations and their goals is kind of a, a first step into how we manage and bring together the sector um, to best um, tailor it, or I don't know if tailor's the word, but to, to best bring the sector together to, um, to move forward and progress in, in that restorative sustainability space. And I'll just answer, I'll just touch on Christine Fox's because it kind of relates. Um, the Mana Moana group or the uh, Māori expert group for our 
case study here on Tamaki Makoto, um, we're kind of reluctant to even um, engage with the term economy. And I know that for Māori operators in this sector, um, that's very important. I think the survey did look at um, some uh, statistics around um, uh, contribution, but not specifically to Māori, but they, that, that data can be um, uh, you know, extrapolated from, this, from the survey results. Uh, can I just read out the question so that yeah. everyone? But thank you. That was great that you great that you went there. Thank you, Kerry. Um, just so Christine asked uh, again from uh, Tafarawaka. Um, in thinking about contribution to Maori economy, is there any statistics on Maori owned operators surveyed? Um, so sorry, pass on through. Yes. So, yeah. So the answer is yeah, yes, Christine. We do from the. Maori operators surveyed, we do break that out in baseline report too, um, about the you know, number of staff and the um, estimated turnover and things like that. Great. And last but not least is Dave Lundquist um, from DOC saying, have you compared your database against DOC held data on companies that hold permits under the Wildlife Act or Marine Mammals Protection Act? Just looking at the map, I think there are some that are missing, so it'd be good cross-validation of the wildlife oriented businesses so I'm assuming you'd love to have a chat. <laughs> yep we've we've already been in contact with some of your colleagues at DOC Dave and I've just made just just wrote a note to follow up with them and um, that's exactly what they they said to they'll be able to cross check it with us and also um, looking forward to more conversations with DOC about how we can um, you know keep those databases and our database up, updated over time. Yeah we've had some great uh, great input and support from DOC uh, throughout the work and, and Suzanne Beckin in particular and, and her colleagues have been fantastic because they obviously have that uh, strong link with tourism. So yes Dave that's a really important point and we, our goal really is not to reinvent the wheel, uh, we want to be able to share and, and um, bring together resources wherever we can and, and that will be a fantastic uh, uh, approach that we will be taking as we move forward. Okay, well, two minutes over, but it's, it's fantastic. We did get through all of the questions. Um, so uh, just say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you to our speakers for a, a, a great um, presentation and uh, looking forward to having a dig around on, on the map and the dashboard. Um, and thank you for all of those questions. It was really good to hear the kororo they've prompted. Um, so thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who came for your time today. Um, and I'll now hand over to Kerian, who's going to close for us. Kia ora. Kia ora, Robin. Kia tai, kia tātai katoa, te atawhai o rangi nui, rawa ku papa atua no kui, mi te aroha o ngā atua Māori, mi te pepe ngā tahitanga o te ira tangata, tūturu, whakamaua, tīna, kia tīna, hau mi e, hui e, tai tīna. Kia ora, kia tai katoa. Kia ora.